Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual Herald Innes Lecture with tonight's special guest speaker, David Miller. And before we begin, I will read the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and celebrate on this land. Uh, there are many guests here tonight, um, and I have the honor of introducing our first. I will uh, introduce this person, and then she will be providing us with an opening to the event. Elder Wabagoon is an Ojibwe elder who sits with the Loon clan, a keeper of sacred pipes and a member of the Lapso First Nation. She is a second intergenerational residential school survival, survivor and a 60s scoop survivor. Wabagoon is a speaker, land defender and water protector. She is currently the inaugural First Peoples Leadership Advisor to the Dean with the Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design and Forestry at the University of Toronto. And I will just add that she's also been a driving force behind uh, the mural project that will be on the north facing wall of the Daniels building. And I urge all of you to make sure you take a look at that project when it's finished. It's quite remarkable. Elder Wabagoon shares her teachings with Indigenous, indigenous youth in a program called Nikabi, Nikabi, sorry, Nikabi Dawadina Giwag, a UFT access program she co-founded and co-leads in the summer months. Now, please welcome Elder Wabaku. Ani, bonjour, andoe magana dog. Wabagoon and Dishnikas and Dunjaba, Obishiko Kang, Mang Dodum. What I just said was a typical Ojibwe greeting saying, hello and welcome all my relations. My name is Wabagoon, flower blooming in spring. And I come from the narrows abundant with white pine. And I sit with the Loon Clan. I'd like to say miigwech to Charlie Kyle uh, um, of Venice College for the introduction and invitation to open this event. And I want to acknowledge him for laying the tobacco that was to be gifted to me, but because of COVID, uh, we make other arrangements, but, but he laid the uh, tobacco under the cherry blossom tree in Ennis College's courtyard. So I say miigwech, Charlie. I'd like to take this opportunity to offer some ceremonial tobacco to the bull and say miigwech to the nations heard in the land acknowledgement and to the land we call Mother Earth. As the freezing moon approaches, Look to nature for your answers. The squirrels are asking you if you were ready for the winter as, as they store their food. Are your blankets ready? The leaves are the first layer of Mother Earth's winter blankets and food for her throughout the winter months before the snow. So please leave them on the ground. A gentle reminder that everything on Mother Earth has a cycle. Whenever we gather, online or in person, we want to open our space in a good way. We want to fill the space with good energy, light, balance, and come together as one and live in harmony on our Mother Earth. I would normally use one of the four sacred medicines to open our space, but because we are online, I'll use water. Everyone will have access to this sacred medicine during or after this event. Water is sacred, water is life. And let us all say thank you to the water when we drink it or interact with it next. I brought with me this evening a mixture of cedar, sweetgrass, and water. It has been simmered on the back stove for hours. I've never let it boil. It also has medicine stones from the Skeena and Bulkley River where they meet at the Great Kazan in British Columbia. 
will offer this medicine water to smudge the space. We want to offer it to Mother Earth to pay our respects to the four directions, the four colors, the winged ones, the swimmers, the crawlers, the root nation, the plant and tree nations, and the four-legged and the two-legged, and the grandfather stones. And we say, miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. As we honor this event with Nibi Mashkiki, I'd like to sing the water song to open and it'll be sung four times for each season. It's for the eastern direction and for the southern direction. For the western direction. To the northern direction, to my grandmothers. So take the time to listen to the loons on the lake. Watch the leaves as they rustle and dance upon the ground. Today is our opportunity to make the world a better place. Remember, the decisions made today will affect the seven generations coming. I say make witch as I honor those who came before me. And I say make witch as I open the space. Apachiko chi witch Thank you very much for listening. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Elder Wabagoon. Beautifully delivered and apt opening for our event, uh, which will be coming to you in a few moments. There are some necessary introductions beyond mine of Elder Wabagoon, and I will be the first person to pass the baton of speech over to our next uh, speaker, who is the co-chair of the Herald Innes Foundation. But before I do that, let me just take a few moments to tell those of you who may not know about Harold and it's just a bit about him and why uh, the speakers we choose uh, fall into some broad categories which are intersecting with the interests of Harold Innes. So Harold Innes is a preeminent political economist. Um, he taught at U of T for many years and of course Innes College is named after him. Innes was known for a far reaching and rather complex set of ideas, uh, many of which touched upon Canada's present and future. Um, one of the many things that he wrote about was the way Canada's economic future was defined by its resource base. And so for that reason, we have decided tonight to focus on the environment and in particular, the way environmental policy can be both shaped and enacted by municipal governments. And no one better to speak to that than a former mayor of Toronto himself and now an environmental figure, David Miller. But lest you think we're getting to the main speaker this quickly, not so fast, uh, because it's my pleasure to introduce, as I said, the co-chair of the Harold Innes Foundation, Sita Ram Kamwal, oh dear, how could I do that? Sita Ram Kalawan Singh, 
whose name I have not mispronounced since I think the first time I said it, way back when, at probably the first Herald in this lecture. Um, but of course, there's always a first time. This is my first time messing it up. So at any rate, uh, Sita, I, I could, if I wished, give you a full dressed treatment of Sita's <laughs> biography, but she is shaking her head. So I will not, I will simply say what I often say, two things. Sita is all things to all people. She's been a great public servant and she is a great friend to the college. And uh, I can think of no one more fitting to pass the baton to this evening than Sita Ramkalawan Singh. Sita. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, for not going on and on about me, because tonight is really not about me. I, I'd like to really thank Elder Wabagoon for sharing her wisdom with us and for asking us to look to nature for answers. Uh, I found that very moving, and I'm so delighted that you could be with us tonight. My role tonight is to bring you greetings from the Harold Innes Foundation, of which I am uh, a board member, and I'm, uh, it's an honor to, to play the role of board chair. The foundation supports scholarships at the college, and we also offer this annual lecture, which are intended to illuminate and provoke and continue on in the tradition of Harold Innes himself. I am very pleased that uh, our former mayor, his Worship David Miller, uh, who will be introduced to you shortly, agreed to give tonight's lecture. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge David's exceptional leadership as the mayor of Toronto. I had a front row seat as I was a member of the Toronto Public Service during his tenure. David was relentless in pursuing a better deal for cities, for championing immigration and refugee issues, as well as human rights. And in 2010, for the first time ever, Mayor Miller hosted the first government to government meeting between Toronto City Council and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The same meeting at which City Council approved a statement of commitment towards Toronto's indigenous communities. And of course, David was a champion of the Tower Renewal Project, which was a major game changer in our city. But it's really not my job to introduce David, but I couldn't resist saying a few words about him. Um, <clears throat> my role tonight is also to introduce Jaron Kerr, who is going to moderate tonight's presentation. Jaron is an exceptional Innes College alumni. He's a former editor of the Varsity and has won many awards for his groundbreaking investigative journalism at Canada Land, the Toronto Star, and now at the Globe and Mail. We are fortunate that he has remained an active member of the Innes College family. He also serves as a director of the Harold Innes Foundation. But that's not all. Last summer, Jaron gave back in an amazing way. I was fortunate to co-chair with him a working group of students from the college on the Black student experience. Jaron was a co-chair, he came to our meetings, he offered ideas, and he worked so wonderfully with the students. Our recommendations were sent to the principal, and Charlie, of course, uh, has already begun implementation of those recommendations. So without further ado, let me invite Jaron to take over the microphone. Thank you so much, Sita. And hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you for being with us here tonight. I'm Jaron Kerr, and I'll be your moderator this evening. And uh, I'll, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. David Miller is the former mayor of Toronto, the managing director, international diplomacy at C40 Cities, and the author of Solved, how the world's great cities are fixing the climate crisis. Uh, I won't delay. Uh, I know you're all excited to hear him. So without further ado, please welcome David Miller. 
Thanks uh, very much, Jaron, for that gracious and mercifully brief uh, introduction. Uh, and to the elder and uh, Sita uh, and the principal, thank you very much for the welcome and the opportunity to give the Herald in this lecture for 2021. I'm very honored uh, and privileged to be doing so. Um, I do have some slides, so I am going to uh, try to share my screen. Um, let's just make sure it works here. And I believe it's shared and working. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to speak about climate change from the perspective of um, uh, somebody who's been involved uh, in the issue for at least 25 years, predominantly um, as an elected official, um, and now working for an organization uh, which consists of elected officials. C40, where I, where I work, where, as Jaron said, I'm the managing director of international diplomacy, is a coalition of 97 of the mayors of the world's largest cities who've come together to help the world avoid dangerous climate change. And the, the theme of my talk tonight, essentially, is that while national governments talk and talk and talk um, and sometimes act, but mostly talk, cities are busy acting on climate change. And there's some very strong reasons for why that's happening. And it's my argument, the argument I make in my book, Sol, that because we need to roughly have emissions uh, globally by 2030, that's what science tells us. If we're to keep overall global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees or below, which is what science tells us uh, is necessary because beyond that, the consequences are even more serious and unpredictable and start to um, uh, pick up in a, in a loop that uh, creates negative reinforcement. Um, we, in order to do that, we need to half global emissions by 2030. And it's my argument that the best way we can do that is take the ideas that are happening in a city somewhere and working today and do them at scale and pace. And the context, of course, for, for my talk in this year's lecture is uh, the Conference of the Parties 26, COP26, which just happened in Glasgow. COP is an annual process under the parties to the relevant international agreement um, on climate change. And this was the 26th one in the 27th year. It was canceled last year because of COVID. I was at COP on behalf of C40 for two weeks. And while as a non-governmental organization, we weren't negotiating, um, we, we were present uh, in the most secure areas. And I, I have some thoughts arising. So um, tonight, I'm going to speak a little bit about what's been happening over the past uh, couple of weeks and the past years, and then uh, a lot um, about my perspective about cities and why COP reinforces uh, my belief that it's in cities that we're going to solve the climate crisis. Um, I hope to do that uh, by about 8 o'clock, and then I look forward to a conversation with Jaron and taking people's questions and comments, a number of which have been submitted uh, beforehand. Um, so from, you know, from many perspectives, and particularly, I think, here in Canada, as we see the unbelievable scenes of flooding in British Columbia, sometimes uh, some of the photos are from the same places that were on fire this summer. I think we really understand as a nation that addressing climate is everything. And this phrase was used at COP by different groups of people, and it means different things to different people. I think people from the developing world are speaking to the need to have what they view essentially as reparations. Uh, it's the richest of the rich, the rich countries and the rich people within them by consuming massive amounts of fossil fuels to create their wealth who have caused the problems of climate, and it's often those who are least well off who are bearing the brunt. So climate change is, is critical to so many different aspects of, of global politics and action, particularly equity and fairness. And I, 
prepared this slide two days ago, and it's already out of date, really, uh, because of what's happening in Canada. But suffice to say that we are seeing climate change today. When I was in office 10 years ago and would speak to these issues, I would say things like, we are going to see an increased severity and frequency of storms. We're going to see more and more extreme heat events. And while you can't, still can't say exactly which storms are caused by climate, we can say with certainty now that the kinds of experiences we're, we're having in British Columbia right now and um, in the summer are climate related because the severity of the, the heat dome and the flash fire that uh, burnt Lytton, British Columbia in about 15 minutes uh, and the severity of, of the flooding we're seeing today are not normal um, and are associated with changing climactic patterns. There's no question about that. And, you know, in three of the last, uh, two of the last four years, we've seen record wildfires in British Columbia. That was predicted. It was specifically predicted as a consequence of climate change. So the events we are seeing are climate change. And I think it's important to recognize that we're experiencing it now. This is a climate emergency. It's having a massive impact. And according to the scientists, we've essentially got nine years to act if we are going to avoid the worst of it. And the worst of climate change could be incredibly difficult. Um, there is the potential for tens of millions, if not more, people migrating because uh, of uh, desertification of what are now arable lands, particularly in Africa. And if you look at the challenges we're having with the relatively political, geopolitical challenges we're having, like along the Polish border at the moment, with a relatively small number of migrants, Imagine how the world will struggle to cope if tens of millions of people are on the move within countries and between countries. We won't be able to cope. And that's uh, one of the many, many risks of uh, climate change if we let it get out of control. So the science is very clear. To avoid catastrophic climate change, we need to keep global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And we see you know, futures under 1.5 that can be relatively green over around two, uh, hotter and hotter and over three, which is certainly possible even still, uh, very, very serious for the planet. In this context, it's really important to understand, I think, uh, the change that's happened globally in the last 25 years in particular about the role of cities. So approximately 12 years ago, for the very first time in human history, as you can see from this chart, urban populations surpassed rural. It's about 2008-2009. And so for the very first time since the dawn of human settlement, we, we became a majority urban world. Before that, we'd been a majority rural world. And that trend is increasing because of the growth of megacities in China and India uh, and Africa and somewhat in Latin America as well. So today, for the very first time in history, the world is an urban world. About 55% of the people now, so past the majority stage in, in 2008 or 2009, about 55% of the people live in cities. Most of the world's economy is in cities. 80% of the gross domestic product, i.e. the economy, most of the world's emissions. And by the way, that's our estimate at C40. There are other others who estimate even higher. The UN estimate of urban global emissions is higher. It's about 77%. But for the purposes of my talk and my analysis of what happened in COP and what we need to do as a society, it's simple enough if it's recognized most people live in cities, most of the economic activity is in cities, and most of the greenhouse gas emissions are in cities. Those are the critical facts uh, when we think about how the world needs to act in order to address climate change. So 
Unfortunately, from my perspective, COP26 did not change a lot. This chart was done in September, just before COP. Some of these countries might have moved around uh, a little bit. Canada, for example, might now be insufficient in its commitments rather than highly insufficient. But the fact is that almost no countries have made commitments that are compatible with 1.5 degrees except Gambia. That's it, the Gambia. Everybody else is inadequate. That's an extreme worry. That is not true for cities. And that's why I'll come back in a few minutes to my thesis, which is if we take the best things that are happening somewhere and do them quickly, it's our best chance to have emissions by 2030. Uh, on a path to, to net zero by 2050. Many people referred to COP26 in Glasgow as our last best chance to avert a climate crisis. And, uh, you know, I, my perspective on this comes, I think, from being involved in city politics. CETA spoke a little bit to some of the achievements we made while um, I was in office as mayor. And there are many others. Because as a mayor and as a city council and as a city government and an institution, as public servants, you're required to react to the challenges that people see in their neighborhoods and communities, and you're required to react in a reasonable time. One of the challenges of the United Nations process and these conference of the parties where they come back to discuss issues that weren't resolved the previous time is that the process requires unanimity. There was an effort at the beginning of these ones to actually have votes, and that was blocked by a number of countries, including Saudi Arabia, who wanted the requirement of unanimity because they're a fossil fuel producing country. So every year, uh, diplomats return, negotiate under circumstances where there has to be unanimous agreement in order to, to move forward. In that context, it's a miracle that six years ago, at COP21 in Paris, the world actually reached an agreement um, that said, climate change is serious. We need to address it. We need to hold overall global average temperature increase to two degrees with efforts to hold it to 1.5 degrees. And each country must set its own targets and come back at COP26 and make them stronger if the science shows that we need them to be stronger. That was nearly a miracle. And there was brilliant work behind the scenes by individuals um, and also by the United States and China in the lead up to it and by France, who uh, were, were amazing in COP21. They did things like, they thought, well, how do we ensure that these people are negotiating all night are happy enough to reach an agreement? Ah. We'll feed them really good food. And they, they made the food incredible for the delegates. Just incredible. I didn't get the sample of food, but I did get the sample of the coffee. It was out of this world, the best espresso I've ever had in my life. But it was nearly a miracle, and it took 21 years. So five years later, actually six because of COVID, at COP26, the goal was to ratchet up these obligations. And did it succeed? Well, it succeeded in a couple of ways. First of all, Glasgow was an exemplary host. It was really terrific. The people of Glasgow, um, the uh, the officials, City Hall, everybody were superb. And that's important because it set a really welcoming tone. And it did succeed in certain things. It succeeded in making a definitive statement that fossil fuels are the cause of climate change, uh, fossil fuel consumption by humans, that is. It succeeded in making a definitive statement that 1.5 degrees is the target, not 2 degrees. And it succeeded in some ways in some other areas, but not nearly as strongly as, as needed to be, particularly on financial support for low-income countries who are feeling the brunt of climate change but didn't cause the problem. So from a diplomatic perspective, people would say, we moved this along. We, we achieved something. And they're right. Unfortunately, the fact is that we need significant action today if 
we're going to do what science tells us we need to and what we must do, which is roughly have global emissions by 2030. So we don't have the luxury of taking 27 years to reach an agreement um, that still requires much more work to be the agreement we we need. We don't have the luxury of that kind of time anymore. So while COP, from one perspective, one could argue uh, uh, was positive, from a more fundamental perspective, a process that takes 27 years just to get us to a point where we've reached an agreement that isn't adequate to solve the problem isn't a process that's ever going to succeed. It's important. It matters that people come together in Glasgow. It matters that there's negotiations. But from my perspective, we need to look elsewhere for the leadership um, that is going to ensure that we do address climate change. And the first place, of course, was to look in the streets. You know, everywhere I was in Glasgow, I heard somebody say, blah, blah, blah. It could be in the secure zone called the blue zone where you had to have special security to get in. It could be in the green zone where the public was. It could be in a restaurant. Uh, it could be riding one of the city bikes stopped at a red light. It could be having dinner. Uh, it could be uh, in a pub. Um, it could be anywhere. Somebody was saying blah, blah, blah. And it's the incredible influence of Greta Thunberg who took three words to say what I have essentially said now in 15 which is we can't rely on the international negotiations of national governments to solve climate change, so we have to look elsewhere. And what we saw in Glasgow was some very big promises by national governments, a new climate pledge from, from India, uh, pledges to cut methane, to, to end deforestation, Canada pledged to stop funding foreign oil exploration, which I found interesting because I didn't know we did fund foreign oil exploration. But a lot of these pledges, from my perspective, are ones that when the details come, we're going to find them uh, to be unacceptable. For example, India stepped forward with a pledge to be net zero by 2070. That's 50 years from now. And its representative was heavily critical of uh, other governments saying, how dare you criticize our use of coal when it made you rich? And then ironically, of course, the last couple of days, the news in India is the incredible uh, smog and air quality problems they're having precisely because of the coal uh, that they're so busily defending and, and trying not to, um, to get rid of. So there were big announcements, but there was a big contrast between these announcements that in effect are promises, some for far off into the future, and what we saw at COP from cities. Cities brought, I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide for a moment, cities brought actions. And I, I'll get into the detail of the collective ones in a minute, but one of the mayors that impressed me incredibly that I've never met before was the mayor of Turku, Finland. Turku is a city of about 200,000 people. It's 800 years old. And Turku, Finland, in the context of national governments promising things like will and will become net zero by 2050, is on track and has committed to becoming a zero carbon city by 2029 and carbon, carbon positive after that. The mayor was quite honest. She said, we've made huge progress getting to that last part is going to be very hard, but that's eight years from now. And we heard again and again and again from mayors at events in City Hall, at events in the COP itself, uh, at side events uh, hosted with business and others, speaking to actual actions they were undertaking this year, next year, and the year after. And for me, that's a really critical difference on why it might be possible to get us where we need to be globally if we can take these best ideas and spread them at scale and pace. This chart shows us what we need to do. So even with the new pledges and targets made at COP26 and in the run-up, like Canada made a pledge in the run-up, um, you can see, if you look at this chart, our emissions, first of all, as a world, are going up. Yes, they went down a little bit because of the economic shutdown 
uh, in order to deal with the global pandemic, but they're essentially on an upward trend. We need to dramatically cut them, and that's the gray bar at the bottom of this chart. The bar next to it, uh, a bright green one, which is a 1.7 degree trajectory, that is assuming everything that national governments have said everywhere happens and happens really quickly. Realistically, we're in the upper bound, which is somewhere over two, possibly as much as three and a half degrees. And if we see you know, what's happened this year in Canada, let alone around the world, uh, Jakarta, by the way, for example, uh, when Australia was on fire, Jakarta was having floods that were so bad that the president of Indonesia said that Jakarta needed to move because the uh, increasing severity and frequency of storms and the potential of sea level rise would make it uninhabitable. Jakarta is a city of over 10 million people. That's the reality of what's happening on the ground, and more and more of that will happen if we end up on the trajectory we're on now, which is the top one, uh, two to, to three degrees, extremely serious. So how do we get off it? Well, from our perspective as an organization, from my perspective as an author and a, a former mayor, our last big chance depends on the action taken today in the world cities, because it's action, it's not just commitments. And here's a, a group of uh, leading mayors, the mayor of uh, Turku is there. The, in the middle, you've got the mayor of Paris, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, Mike Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, uh, the mayor of Dhaka North behind him, uh, the council leader of uh, Glasgow is on the left in a, a black uh, dress with a, a blue blouse. Next to her is the mayor of Phoenix, the mayor of Athens. A number of others, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and each of these mayors and many more are taking climate change seriously in a way that's feasible and a way that can ensure the ideas spread. So what happened at COP from a city's perspective? We heard the individual actions of individual cities. We also heard some collective actions. For example, a group of Latin American cities, including the mayor of Bogota, who was in the Last uh, photograph uh, have pledged to rapidly scale up their purchase of electric buses. And Bogota, by the way, is building its first subway ever in the history of this city under the, the uh, leadership of the same mayor. And a coalition of uh, international private sector funders have signed a commitment to fund, to provide a billion dollars to fund the transformation of bus fleets in Latin America uh, from diesel to electric. It's already begun in cities like Bogota and Santiago, and this money will expedite the transition, and that's happening now. It's not a pledge for something in 2070 or 2050 or something that sounds extremely unlikely, like phasing out deforestation. It's a real action now to address a real need. Second area uh, that a coalition of cities spoke to, uh, including uh, businesses and construction companies, was tackling emissions from the global construction se sector, because almost uh, a quarter of global emissions, depending how you uh, count them, uh, comes from construction. And if you look at the boom in places like China, this is extremely serious. And again, it's an area where real action is starting now to address emissions. And finally, an unprecedented coalition of over a thousand cities and governments joined the city's race to zero. And the city's race to zero is a commitment to do your share of having emissions by 2030 on a path to net zero by 2050. And in order to join, you, you not only make that commitment, you have to specify the action areas that you're going to undertake. And there are uh, different action areas, I'll get into to the broad brush in a moment, um, uh, different action areas that the cities have committed to take can be transportation, uh, buildings, uh, divestment from fossil uh, fuel funding, many areas. Um, and there are ways the cities can report their actions and their impact and measure their emissions. And all of this is based on the same concept that if we take what is happening – 
in the world's major cities and share that broadly so it can happen at pace and scale across the world, we do have a possibility of taking the actions needed, not just the pledges, not just the statements, over the next nine years to address global warming. So the city's race to zero um, is based on the concepts underlying C40's Deadline 2020 plan. And what Deadline 2020 is, is a commitment that C40 cities made after Paris to keep to do their fair share of keeping the world to 1.5 degree pathway. So what C40 did in partnership with Arup, which is a, a global engineering company, is essentially measure the amount of carbon, some people call this a carbon budget, the amount of carbon each city could emit as part of its share of the amounts that was allowable to be emitted globally if we were going to keep to 1.5 degrees and it's a condition of membership if you as a mayor want your city to remain as a member of the 97 uh, c40 cities that represent collectively about 700 million people about 25 percent of the world's gdp and be part of the c40 you had to make this commitment um, measure your emissions and undertake a plan to address them and what deadline 2020 basically showed was that in the global north, cities need to peak emissions by 2020, have them by 2030, reach net zero by 2050. In the global south, there's a bit more leeway about the first part uh, of when emissions needed to be peaked, but, but everybody has to do their fair share of having emissions by 2030. And I'm proud to say that about two thirds of the C40 cities have such a plan uh, about half have peaked emissions, and this compares to the national government figures where there's one country, the Gambia, uh, that's met its commitments. More to do. All of the C40 cities need to be on board. As I said, it's a, a condition of membership, and if you don't undertake it and don't have the plan underway very shortly, uh, you will be asked to leave as a city. Um, but what's inspiring to me is that the city's race to zero is based on these principles. Uh, cities can use different um, ways of measuring their emissions. Deadline 2020 is a, appropriate for big, really large cities, smaller towns. There's some other systems that, that we can support them with. But what has been done is take the principles that underlie climate action from the world's largest cities and then say, how do we ensure that another thousand, maybe even another 10,000 over time can do the same thing? And in that way, it's possible to ensure that the ideas and actions that are happening in the world's uh, biggest cities can spread at the pace and scale needed uh, to address the issue. So what is happening in the world's biggest cities? Well, they have to have a climate plan. And uh, as I indicated earlier, somewhere around 70% of greenhouse gas emissions are in uh, are in cities or uh, uh, created by the actions needed to support them. For example, if you have a coal-fired power plant that powers the electricity in the city, that counts in the greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's inside the city or, or just outside. Um, and those greenhouse gas emissions are really in four areas. In how we generate electricity, how we heat and cool buildings and build them, um, how we manage our waste and our transportation. And if we can address those areas, then cities can dramatically lower their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in each of those areas, there's a city globally that is doing something tremendous with existing technology today uh, to address these emissions. So for example, in Toronto, this uh, is Exhibition Place, which is a net zero consumer of electricity. There's giant solar arrays there, which mo most people don't know. Of course, people do know the, the wind turbine. But we have deep lake water cooling. We pioneered this globally by using uh, lake water at the bottom of Lake Ontario, which remains the same temperature year round. We were able to take all of the downtown office buildings off air conditioning which at the time was supplied by the Lakeview coal-fired plant. So a huge drop in green, greenhouse gas emissions because of that. 
that action. And that's something that anybody behind a, beside a body of water that has um, uh, is deep enough uh, to have constant temperatures year round can do. And it's applicable to, to ocean areas as well. Although, of course, the technology when you have salt water will be uh, a little bit different. But it's way beyond Toronto. Los Angeles controls its own energy supply. When the current mayor, Eric Garcetti, who's the chair of C40, um, uh, first got elected, their energy supply was something like uh, 34% coal, uh, a lot oil and natural gas. Under his leadership, they have changed the uh, energy mix. So by 2030, it will be 97% clean and entirely clean two or three years later, which is an extraordinary achievement and shows what can be done anywhere, uh, city or not. And then we have cities like Melbourne in Australia, which has no authority over its electricity at all. Uh, unfortunately, long ago, the, the public utilities were privatized and it has changed the electricity supply in Melbourne uh, by using its purchasing power and partnering with other big institutions like hospitals um, and uh, universities so that all of the electricity consumed by the city of Melbourne itself today uh, is fossil fuel free. And this is a, so there's different examples in different cities, what, depending on the regulatory authority and the control over the power grid. But the results can be the same of dramatic reductions in emissions. Buildings is a hugely important area, and there's not time today to do it justice. Uh, I could probably give an entire lecture on buildings. But simple, simply to say that in most cities, how we heat, cool, and construct buildings is our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. It's really quite remarkable, and it's not as well known, I think, by people as solar power, wind power, electric vehicles, but it's hugely, hugely important. In Toronto, it's around 40% at the moment of, of greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Toronto, it's a geographic area. Uh, New York, it's around 70% at the moment. Even in really spread out cities where um, you know cars are the major source of greenhouse gases, like Houston perhaps, um, it uh, is still a really significant source. And the good news is there are models globally of addressing emissions from new buildings, from construction, and from existing buildings that can get us on a path uh, to net having emissions by 2030. The bad news is not enough places are doing them. So, for example, Vancouver's building code requires uh, zero operational emissions by 2030 and a dramatic reduction in uh, the greenhouse gases caused by the construction. At the same time, Canada as a country has been consulting about its national building code, which is voluntary, for six years. Why don't you just take Vancouver's? It's the state of the art in the world building code uh, for new buildings. And if we replicated that across Canada, it would be hugely significant. Of course, most buildings that are going to exist in 2030 and even in 2050 uh, in the Canadian, American and European context, a bit less so in China, already exist. And we need to address those as well. Um, see to mention Tower Renewal, which is an interesting program by the city of Toronto. Uh, to address greenhouse gas emissions in apartment buildings built out of concrete in the 60s, 70s, and 80s by adding external cladding, which is very inexpensive. The architect Graham Stewart describes it as like putting a coat on the building. If the thousand buildings, uh, multi-residential apartment buildings in Toronto that are made out of concrete put that coat on today, they would be uh, their greenhouse, the greenhouse gas emissions of Toronto as a geographic area will be reduced by 5%. That's how significant it is. Think about if we had a program like that across Canada. Um, and this program has been running for a decade. There's absolutely no reason we can't have it across Canada. And then there's cities like New York, which are simply legislating that buildings need to dramatically reduce their carbon by 2030 particularly in New York's case on commercial buildings, because that's where its biggest emissions are. And now people in New York, including the building sector, are saying, 
uh, let's find some really interesting mechanisms to finance that. They're talking about having a cap and trade program within New York on buildings to ensure this can happen quickly and properly. That's an idea they took from Tokyo, which already for 10 years has had a cap and trade program on buildings. Interestingly, for cultural reasons, I understand, in Tokyo, everybody complies with the cap and there's very little trading because nobody wants to be seen to be violating the principle and the rules. Waste management is extremely important, particularly in Africa. The key everywhere is the methane needs to be captured. Even if you clean it and use it as a fuel, you're far better off from a greenhouse gas perspective than simply allowing it to escape to the atmosphere. And in many African cities, Managing informal waste and informal landfills is the most important thing in reducing greenhouse gases. And there are some really interesting examples like Accra, which has dramatically reduced its greenhouse gases and created good, um, more stable jobs for people employed in the informal sector by closing informal landfills and building a proper waste management uh, system and thoughtfully ensuring that people who were formerly employed in the informal sector can get jobs in the formal sector. Final point I want to speak to is transportation. This is also a topic that one could lecture, uh, an entire Harold Innes lecture on. But if we are going to address climate change, we need to ensure that our cities are places where people can live without having to own a car. And that means we have to think about our cities in the way that people in this movement of 15 minute cities uh, speak to, which is our cities should have neighborhoods where people can live, can work, can meet their daily needs for recreation, for nature, for shopping, without having to drive around the area. And in addition to that, the cities need to be based on excellent public transit, excellent ability to walk and excellent cycling. And there are very good examples of this happening. Many mayors in COVID, uh, because of the necessity to help people be outside have taken dramatic strides like they have in Paris and Barcelona towards a 15-minute city. And there are great examples of rapid transit networks being built, like this one in Addis. In the time we've been debating whether we should complete the light rail network that Council proposed in 2007 or use all of the money to build one subway stop in Scarborough, Addis Ababa has thought about uh, created, found the financing for, built, and is operating its first light rail transit system ever, and is now thinking about how to extend it. And by the way, in building this system and designing it, one of the things that they consciously and deliberately thought about was, what are the needs of our biggest group of riders of our informal transit networks that this is going to be replacing? And that group of riders was women. And, and the government consciously thought about how do we serve the needs of the women of Addis by building light rail. And I can say with some certainty that there are very few uh, uh, northern cities in Canada, the United States, or Europe that, it, that have ever had that thought. And it's an interesting example of how cities can learn from each other, because we have as much to learn from Addis as they have to learn from us. Final couple of things that, that are happening that are a bit more indirect, but for me, extremely exciting. So the greenhouse gas emissions, electricity, uh, waste, transportation, uh, buildings. Oh, and I have to mention one more transportation. Shenzhen, China, all of its transport is electric. All of its uh, buses, all, all of its fleets at least, all of its buses, all of its taxis, and so forth. You know, other places are considering pilots. It's really time, given that we're in a climate emergency, it's actually time to move to zero emission vehicles. It's been proven uh, in places like Shenzhen, China, uh, that they're viable and it works, and we need to move at pace and scale. And this echoes the point I was making earlier, that, that they, if we can take these very best ideas, like the way Addis thought about its public transport, or how Shenzhen has converted its transportation systems uh, to electric, or the way uh, Paris and Barcelona have ins ensured their cities have become much more friendly for people walking, cycling, and taking transit. Uh, 
and we can take those ideas globally uh, over the, the next few years rather than waiting till 2050, we can make a, a massive stride forward um, in reducing greenhouse gases. So two other points I want to make, and then I'll just give a, a little a couple of thoughts about Toronto and, and then look forward to your questions. One of the advances that was spoken about in Glasgow is uh, climate budgeting, which uh, Oslo is the leader, but other cities are looking at. And what they do is take the amount of carbon that the city's allowed, so the carbon budget I spoke to earlier that's in their plan, and then ensure that the city plans and budgets address climate change and live within that carbon budget. So in the same way that if you're building a community center or a rink, a hockey rink or improving a curling rink, let's say, in Oslo, you have to have a financial budget. You cannot improve that uh, curling rink unless you deal with the carbon it might emit and do it within the climate budget and the carbon budget of the city. And I, I for me, this is an idea that not only should resonate in cities. It's an idea that should resonate in provinces, states, and national governments as well. Because if we're serious about saying we need to limit overall global emissions to a certain figure, it is eminently possible to say how much of that figure each country, each province, each city should get, and then force the system to live within it exactly the same way as we do today with money. We know how to do this. In fact, I would advise that, that the finance department of a major city be the ones in charge of the climate budget because they know how to ensure departments follow budgetary rules. The second thing we've seen a massive movement is cities uh, divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, New York and London and Co Copenhagen uh, all led uh, the charge several years ago. You can see the years circled. It was 2018. Um, uh, that the, the city started divesting. And we're now seeing, finally, after years of pressure from students and others, uh, universities, foundations, um, and others starting to divest from fossil fuel. And from my perspective, the fact that city governments, and in particular New York and London, who represent the two biggest financial capitals in the Western world, that those mayors chose to divest being actual governments, not just advocates, was hugely important in putting wind in the sails of the divestment movement, and we're really starting to see change happen. Final point is, all of the mayors who have climate plans uh, ensure that those climate plans think about uh, equity. And I, they do it for a variety of reasons. One is most of them are progressive mayors and want to build cities that, that are welcoming for everybody. But a second is that mayors are acting on climate change because they can, but often also because they must. Houston, for example, uh, people have probably heard about Hurricane Harvey in which more rain fell in an hour than, goes, than water goes over Niagara Falls in a year. It was a once in 500 year storm. In the four years around that year, Houston had two other once in 500 year storms. Um, the mayor of Houston has to act on climate because those storms are climate related and it's not possible for that city to recover from that amount of rainfall again and again and again. The damages are incredible. Um, so mayors can act. They're compelled to act by circumstances and events. But they also know uh, that if they don't ensure that everybody has a say in how these policies and plans are created, and knows that it benefits them and their families, they won't succeed in continuing the political support to act. So all of these climate plans address equity, and most of them were developed in partnership with the, the residents of these cities. Final point I wanted to make is just to pull it all together and show what's happened in, in Toronto as an example of bold climate action close to home. 2007 City Council unanimously passed the city's first climate action plan, Changes in the Air. One of the things in this plan, by the way, was a huge transit expansion strategy then called Transit City. Uh, 
Uh, it's been pieced up since, but it's still uh, plugging along with most of the lines uh, either underway or on the drawing board. As a result of that plan, and as a result of the provincial closure of the Lakeview Power Plant, the City of Toronto today is 33% below 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And 1990 is the baseline of the Kyoto Accord, which was the first agreement for all of this in the United Nations framework on climate change. So <clears throat> Toronto is an example of what works. This is for the geographic area, not uh, just for the city operations. And that plan was uh, renewed after 10 years. Toronto's challenge today, it's stalled. And it needs to bring emissions down much more. And for me, initiatives like the climate budgeting, uh, more initiatives around public transport, walking and cycling, and really addressing emissions from buildings can help Toronto get there and get there in an equitable, equitable way. And this is the final point I wanted to make to bring these themes together. Why am I confident that mayors will act this way? I'm confident because what they're doing when they act in climate on climate is they're making their cities the kind of places that people want to live. And what do I mean by that? When we were consulting about the Shepherd East uh, light rail transit project, I went out one morning uh, and took the Malvern bus down to Shepherd before six in the morning with my assistant Clyde, who lived in Malvern. Um, and there was a woman on the Malvern bus who got onto the Shepherd bus. And I went and spoke to her. I had a whole bunch of brochures. I was speaking to everybody I was giving to them. And um, she, uh, and I spoke to her about the Transit City Plan and the, Sh and the Shepherd East light rail in particular. And by the way, the Transit City Plan was the plan I referred to that came out of our climate strategy. It's a transportation plan for the city because it's a network. It answers planning needs for the city because it allows growth in Toronto. In that way, you can stop sprawl, uh, which you know new highways are designed to facilitate, has terrible environmental and economic consequences, and always doesn't work. Uh, after about 10 years, we, we know this around Toronto. We need to invite uh, growth that's going to happen in this region into the city. And it's also a social justice strategy. And if you look at the transit city lines next to the priority investment neighborhoods, and those were the neighborhoods that had the highest correlation between low incomes and low historic investment in public services, you'll see these lines almost perfectly serve those neighborhoods. So, and that wasn't an accident because the lines were designed where the busiest bus routes were. And who tends to, to take the bus in any rich city? It tends to be the lowest income people. And I, uh, I know this, when mom and I came to Canada, we lived in Ottawa. Uh, we took the bus because mom did not want to drive in a country with snow on the roads and the kind of icy streets we saw in Ottawa. So I took the bus everywhere. I grew up taking the bus. It's an excellent mode of transportation. But in our context, uh, it tends to be used more often than not by lower income people. And so the busiest bus routes, which were being replaced by light rail, are those serving neighborhoods with high concentrations of people of low income and historically a lack of public investment, including transit. So in that context, I get on the bus on Shepherd East and I, I say to, to this woman, uh, well, in fact, she says to me, Mayor, what are you doing on my bus? I said, I've come to talk about the Shepherd LRT. She said, what's an LRT? I said, it's sort of a European style tra tram. It runs down the middle of your street. It has its own right of way, so it doesn't get stuck in rush hour traffic. Um, and because we're building it down the middle of the street, it's very affordable and we can build it really quickly. She said, that's great. I'd love to have that. It would help me a lot. Where are you going? I'm going to work. She worked at Pearson. So I asked her how she got there. And she said, well, I took the Malvern bus, the Shepherd bus, the subway, the subway. And then I take the Finch West bus and then the Moulton bus. So that's four buses, two subway rides. How long does it take? Well, in the summer, two hours, but sometimes in the winter, I miss my connections. You have a really long day. Well, Mr. Mayor, that's just my morning job. In the afternoon, I'm a cleaner at Royal York Hotel. She probably spent four hours a day on transit. Imagine how her life could be transformed if she had 
far better access to rapid transit instead of being on a bus that gets stuck in the same traffic that cars are stuck in in rush hour. She might get an hour back a day, maybe more. And with that hour, perhaps she could simply be at home with family and her for dinner. Perhaps she could go back to school like my mother did at the age of 56 and upgrade her skills so she could have one full-time job. Or perhaps she could go to the public meetings that were talking about canceling the Shepherd East LRT and using the money to build a one-stop extension to the subway taking people downtown and participate in the active local democracy and say, no, I want that. That's good for me. Whatever she chose, the action that was ensuring that Toronto could become a far lower carbon place to live in would also be an action that ensured that she had a better chance at a meaningful and rich life and could participate in the democratic and social life of our city. And that, to me, is why mayors are acting on climate. Not just because they can, not just because they must, but because the best ones know that it helps them build the kind of city that they want to lead and most people want to live in. That's really what I wanted to say today. I want to leave you with the Climate is Everything slide, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much for, for your time and attention, um, and uh, look forward to, to the next few minutes. Thank you. Jaron, back to you. David, thank you so much. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Uh, builds on a lot of things that you've written in your book, obviously, and I think uh, everybody learned a lot from it. Um, we've received a ton of interesting questions, um, which is great, love that participation. I'll start with a couple of my own and we'll pretty quickly move over to um, some other people's questions. And so we'll start with this. Your thesis obviously is that cities are ideally suited to pursuing climate justice because mayors, they know their constituents, they have to work on these swift timelines. And another thing you didn't expand on too much here, but you did write in your book, you, you can't be weighed down by ideolo ideological jousting. Things need to get done. You need to take action. I'm wondering, can other levels of government augment themselves to become more city-like in their climate efforts? Obviously, cities might be the most augmented. How can we push provinces and, and countries to sort of act in the same way, if, if that's possible? They certainly can. Some do. I'd point to... Uh, you know, some of the European countries, they're actually like Germany's electricity system in which it allowed people to earn money by generating uh, solar power on the roofs um, was transformative. So, yes, national governments are theoretically capable of it, but they've been shockingly um, uh, poor at actually doing it. And I point to Canada as one of those. I think our federal government gets a lot of credit for climate change because they say all the right things and they brought in a carbon price. But if you look at what's happening with Canadian emissions, they're going up, they're not going down. Unlike you know, what happened in Toronto between about 2008 and 2018. Um, so I, I really worry, of course they can, they've got the powers. You know, The federal government could, for example, it could say our building code, which isn't mandatory, but which tends to set the standards, it will reach the levels of Vancouver, it'll be a world leading building code. They could electrify all of the federal government fleets, including the post office. They could um, find ways through industrial policy to support the electric vehicle industry and ensure that, you know, as they're fighting with President Biden about his desire to have America lead on that. Canada can re retain a leading role. Uh, they could invest in train travel and phase out uh, short haul flights, um, you know, close the island airport, for example, and, and ensure that you could get to um, Montreal and Ottawa uh, very quickly by train. And those plans, everything I'm talking about, the plans are on the books. They could fund Toronto's tower renewal program, but make it national. So it was easy and simple um, to uh, to do energy retrofits on apartment buildings. Lots and lots of things they can do. And these are just the things that I know well. And I, for me, uh, I just I find uh, 
the lack of action by national governments in the North American context to be very disappointing because there's so many things they could do. And, you know, yes, they can do it. Unfortunately, they're not. Right. Right. I want to talk about labor for a little bit. Uh, we see this issue in Alberta, especially, but it's happening in all across the world in all parts of the country. And there's actually a good example in your book. You present an example of a time where you were pushing to install solar uh, hot water heaters. And some of the plumbers in the city said no. Uh, we don't need to get into the details of why they said no, but at first they were they were resistant to it. And I guess the real point is is the effect that climate change will have on labor in terms of reskilling and retraining. Um, how do we accelerate that process so people that are working in, you know, these sort of infrastructure jobs can effectively do things that are more beneficial to the climate? I, it's a great question. Um... The, I, I got to come back to the Toronto example at the end, but it's a really fantastic question. And I worry sometimes that um, uh, some parts of the labor movement, if not included in processes from the beginning, will become sort of the last bastion of fighting back because people are seeing their jobs disappear and they don't have any choice. And so, you know, I'm involved in a few efforts to try to overcome this in partnership with uh, the AFL-CIO in the case of Los Angeles and with the partnership of the largest trade union in Africa in the case of South Africa. And it's very, it's difficult because if somebody's got, you know, a job paying $100,000 in a coal-fired power plant, they are not going to want to get a minimum wage job um, you know, in the nearby town selling coffee. And you have to take these concerns really seriously. Ontario did it very well when they closed Lakeview. You know, there was barely a ripple. It's more complicated when it's sort of disaggregated and it's not a public utility who can keep the people working somewhere else. So I, I think it's a really good question. The jury is out yet about the best ways to engage, uh, to sort of build an alternate path so people know that they, and particularly their children, will have really decent jobs. And if you, people don't trust the system, and I don't blame them. If you look back when uh, the Canada US Free Trade Agreement was signed by then Prime Minister Brown Mulroney, he said, we'll have the greatest trade. Labor said, hundreds of thousands are gonna lose their jobs. Mulroney said, it's good for Canada, and we'll have the greatest transition programs ever. What happened? Hundreds of thousands of people lost their jobs and there were no transition programs. Labor remembers that. So, you know, you have to actually build a just transition. And that's why we're working in Los Angeles. We're working in Warsaw. We're working in South Africa with the unions there and with the city governments. And in South African case, with the utility to actually get some working examples of how to make it work properly. And I, it's the, Great scale, some small good examples, but it's scaled on that properly. I just plumbers issued the permit. Plumbers who issued problem with the water heaters, and it was funny because it, they were employed by the city. So ultimately, they reported to the mayor and council, and the mayor and council had said, we want to do solar water, hot water, and the plumbing department said no, which is related, but slightly different different uh, issue. Right. Well, we're get, actually getting a bunch of questions about something, and I'm going to kind of combine them into uh, one that I have. And then I think after this, I might have one more, and then we'll move to just audience questions, because there's a lot of good ones. Um, you can feel free to riff on this one because I think it touches on a lot of things people are curious about. But when you talk about reducing car dependency, uh, reducing sprawl uh, and creating 15 minute neighborhoods, that's an interesting situation because cities, as you say, are often very nimble. But to use Toronto as an example, um, one of the things that's a slower process municipally is, is densifying certain neighborhoods, especially ones that are under the official plan, close to transit, 
um, it can be a slow process to add more housing in places where people wouldn't need a car. And part of that is because of zoning, part of that is because of community consultation and people challenging those developments for various reasons. Sometimes they're very legitimate, sometimes maybe less so. But regardless, it's, it's a major challenge. And so I'm wondering, how do you, how do you get buy-in to create 50-minute neighborhoods in a city like Toronto? Because some people might argue the fastest way to, to build is actually something that's very unpopular, which is um, MZOs by the province, right? So how do we get buy-in so those sorts of things maybe don't need to happen as much? I, it's a great question. And I there is a disastrous history of provincial intervention uh, in Toronto matters. They don't know what they're doing institutionally, and it's always driven politically. And the current MZOs all appear to have at least a hint of corruption, if not blatant five alarm fire of corruption. Um, from my perspective, there's often a discussion, um, including in the uh, letters to the editor page of the Globe, oh, we need experts to decide this. Don't you know? take it out of the hands of the people. I think that's exactly the opposite of what needs to be done. I firmly believe uh, that um, citizens can engage on these issues and will, and will do it in a positive way. However, you need to do a couple of things. First of all, you need to connect the dots. So council needs to be saying to people, this is part of our climate change strategy and part of our housing cost strategy. We are undertaking um, zoning changes, for example, in this neighborhood to ensure that your children can afford to live in Toronto. And because we all know that when we allow sprawl, we have disastrous consequences. There's an issue of leadership and clarity. And the best mayors um, provide that leadership and are prepared to do it. And you have to be prepared to stand up and some people are gonna disagree with you. Second thing is you, you have to have uh, a thoughtful and sensible approach. And what we tried to do when I was in office was say, we are gonna direct intensification to where there is rapid transit or there will be rapid transit. And I think if you combine that with some uh, intelligent policies and really good design, you can get an awful lot of buy-in. It doesn't mean that there should be a 50 story building at the corner of High Park and Bloor. I don't agree with that. But it does mean you can probably have eight to 12 story buildings all the way across Bloor Street. And that's an awful lot of housing, uh, affordable, accessible, non-car based. And if you look at, at what we've got now on huge swaths of the Danforth, you've got two and three story buildings. Huge potential if the city thinks about it sensibly and, and listens to the neighborhoods and talks with them and says to people in single family homes, if you wanna keep that little enclave, the best thing you can do is ensure that the main street uh, gets suitably developed. And I think uh, we're already some less pushback over that kind of development, not the 40 story ones. Jaron, am I still, uh, my internet connection says it's unstable. So if I go out, please just tell me that I've uh, disappeared. I can hear you clearly now. I missed you at the very end, but we got most of your answers. So um, I'm gonna get to an, an audience question uh, from Eric who asks, um, the international community has agreed to cut emissions by significant amounts, but how can we ensure that we have global emissions uh, have by global emissions by 2030 when we don't have good data on those emissions. Reporting on emissions is voluntary and the Washington Post found that there's massive underreporting. Um, only 45 countries reported emissions in 2019, the rest didn't report. So essentially, how do we deal with um, insufficient or imperfect um, data around emissions? Well, I, I think you buy into my thesis, which is um, if we're going to get anywhere, 
we need to take the actions that we know work and spread them at pace and scale. And it gets around the problem because it doesn't matter if if we're helping Warsaw decarbonize its building sector, uh, it doesn't matter the pole and doesn't calculate its emissions because we can know the global emissions. So um, it doesn't matter is putting it too, too bluntly. But I think the one of the ways to deal with the problem of voluntary reporting is to really push action at scale that we know works and rely on the measuring of by cities, uh, which can be done, and the global measuring uh, that is done through the UNCCC and others. Um, past that is an interesting conundrum, and it's an example of you know the problem with the voluntary framework that we have. It's, it's an analogous problem to the to the trying to get countries to voluntarily act as well. Right. Uh, another question we have from the audience: um, What role does the expansion of cycling infrastructure play in mitigating climate change? Is the Copenhagen model useful for other cities? Yes. Uh, I mean, we can't all be Copenhagen because uh, it's flat and um, it's weather accommodates cycling. But I firmly believe, uh, particularly if you accompany cycling infrastructure with a real push to ensure that uh, people can work from home and there's more attention to having jobs in neighborhoods, and um, you know people's needs like childcare and recreation and and uh, green space um, and, and you know food shopping and things and entertainment are met within their neighborhoods. I think cycling is a really critically important part of the answer. You know, when I was in Glasgow. I used their equivalent of city bike every day, um, and it was fantastic. I rode to the conference. Uh, except one day when there was a fresh bees breeze, which is a BBC euphemism for a downpour. They call it fresh, apparently. Um, but I used it all the time. I got all around Glasgow. Now, you know, compared to Toronto, Glasgow is a small footprint. But I think it's a huge part of it. Plus, it addresses other issues. It helps us be healthier. You know, you get to know your neighbors better. And I, I we... It's interesting to see the progress that's been made in cycling infrastructure in Toronto the last couple of years because it was an area that there were pitched battles in 15 years ago, and now it's become much more normalized. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, in terms of the, this is another question I'm going to paraphrase from the audience. Uh, the auto, automobile industry is still behind where it needs to be to support the targets we now have. What actions can be taken to support this industry to be able to affect the changes we need going forward? I guess, you know, that's another half of this question. We're focused on cities, but we have, you know, massive suburbs and, and a lot of people are still going to continue to drive. Um, maybe preferably they would be electric vehicles, but how can we maybe push industry in that direction? Well, I think in terms of the cascade, you want everywhere to be places people choose to walk can. You want them to be able to choose to cycle. You want them to have good access to transit and only drive if they really have to. And there's an awful lot of work that can be done to make those kind of changes. For me, the electrification, where we need to go with the industry is to electrify fleets. Like, you know, a few years ago, the city of Toronto allowed Uber to operate, which was essentially giving it taxi licenses for free, which had, you know, immediately beforehand had been three dollars so you know let's say a thousand times three hundred and fifty thousand whatever that is i think it would be well within the city's rights today to say if you want to operate uh in our city you need to be electric and if you do this with fleets start with uber start with taxi start with the post office um <clears throat> you can then transform the manufacturing industry at the same time, I think the Canadian government needs to think far more about industrial policy. Um, you know, we rely on trade deals with the U.S. and the rules in them. When we know full well the U.S. will always do Buy American, why aren't we saying to Ford and GM and Honda and Toyota and everybody else who manufactures in Ontario, we value your manufacturing, 
we're going to purchase our government vehicles from you. We're going to place massive fleet orders. The post office is going to order, you know, vans from from uh, Ford. Um, the uh, you know RCMP is going to order uh, some of its cars from from GM. Whoever there there is a massive opportunity to use a strategy where we really push the electrification of fleets to change the equation for the manufacturers so it becomes much more economic and therefore cheaper for people to buy electric vehicles and to use the massive purchasing power of the federal government provinces and cities and towns uh, to, to aid that. And it can be done. New York City has something like 15,000 uh, electric or hybrid vehicles. Um, it's, you know, it's on its way. And to me, that's the best way to overcome the manufacturing side of it. Different answer to how you get people in, involved. But if you overcome the manufacturing, the costs will drop. And that's one of the biggest obstacles. Right. OK, well, I know that we're, we're running short on time. So I'll try to get one more audience question. and Maybe I'll ask a final question uh, from my own list. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> OK. Well, this actually kind of ties in with one that I was going to ask. This somebody is asking about um, energy used by major companies like like Shell and, and burning fossil fuels, and so maybe I can tie that in to something I wanted to ask, which is more about how we encourage people to to do their own part. Um, we're often told, and it's often true, that the largest polluters are are a fairly small group of large companies, and that you know real climate action is going to require them to change their practices or cease to exist or completely alter the way they do business. And of course, there's there's validity to that. But what would you say to people who think they can kind of maybe be free riders or or that's the most important thing, and so their individual actions don't matter as much? What's your advice on keeping people and yourself and, and people around you accountable uh, in the face of of comments like that? Well, I, I do think this is a collective issue that needs to be solved collectively um, through you know, our elected officials. But what we're seeing, you know, what we saw in Glasgow was it's cities and to some extent businesses that are really the ones who are rising to the challenge. Um, and by the way, parenthetically, Jaron, not to an answer your question, I saw somebody, uh, somebody asked about donut economics in it. Um, and the city of Nanaimo and Janet, I just want to say that's a very, very interesting and thought-provoking approach. And I think there's a lot to what Kate Rayworth says, which is about changing the, the underlying economics of it all. I, uh, to be as think about a society where we meet people's needs more than, than we meet wants. Um, but aside from that, I, I, for me, the answer is it's a collective problem. We need to solve it collectively, but our individual actions do matter. In a way, they matter in the same areas that I was talking about, the cities, transportation, uh, buildings, waste, and energy generation. So I say to people, ask yourselves the question, you know, in those areas and in what you eat, are, are you living a low carbon lifestyle? Are you part of the solution? You know, we uh, got rid of our car a few years ago. Predominantly, we take public transit and cycle and walk. Occasionally, we'll, we'll rent a shared car like a zip car or a moto in, in Vancouver. Um, I travel for work. That's my place where I create emissions. Um, and uh, C40 has a program to dramatically reduce that. And now that everybody meets on Zoom, my travel's gone, you know, dropped under well nine percent but that was a big one for me um i eat a lot more vegetarian meals i'm not more i'm not entirely vegetarian so for me first thing is your actions there are things you can and should do even though it's a collective problem the second thing is use your voice people's voices really matter look greta Thunberg has done more than anyone else in the world to change the ability of politicians who who are trying to to act on climate and you know her blah 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 just sums everything up so people's voices matter i can't tell you the number of business leaders have told me they're interested in climate action because their employees when they're interviewing them ask them what their green principles are these don't even get the job so it's amazing people's voices are powerful so your actions your voices 
And of course, the third one really matters and answers some other questions here, your vote. I mean, vote for elected officials who are taking meaningful action on climate. Not just the ones who say they will, uh, the ones who really do it. Definitely. Well, you know what? Let's. There's so many questions from from myself that I haven't asked. So many from the audience, but we do have to end somewhere, and I think that's a, probably a good place to end. Um, so, David, thanks so much for answering our questions, for your remarks. Uh, really interesting, really engaging conversation that I think we all benefited from. So, uh, to wrap up the night, we have um, Kristen Karpinchik, who's a student from Innis, and she'll provide some close, closing remarks. Hi, uh, thanks, Sharon. So on behalf of Ennis College Urban Studies and the audience, I would like to thank you, David Miller, for taking the time to share with us this evening your insightful presentation about the role in which cities like Toronto can play in responding to urgent climate change challenges, as well as providing us with your firsthand experience and candid remarks from COP26 in Glasgow. With the amount of climate change related disasters happening globally, the fear of running out of time to act and the heightened inequities felt by those most vulnerable, it can be overwhelming at times to consider what, if anything, the average person can do in the face of increasing climate change challenges. Your insight on the way that various cities around the world have stepped up to take immediate climate change actions while national government's talk was inspiring and a reassuring reminder that individuals, communities, and cities worldwide can work together, sharing their knowledge and successful strategies, have the power to address local and global inequities, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to achieve net zero by 2050, and create a more sustainable future for everyone. Thank you again for sharing your knowledge and taking a leadership role to inspire climate change action within cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen, uh, for those closing comments. Uh, it's left to me to say a bunch of thank yous, but before I get to that, because I often forget my duty when it comes to book giveaways, I want to announce the three recipients of David Miller's book. There he is holding it, and soon you can be holding it in your hands if you are one of the following three people. Nancy Kahn, Ingrid Paquette, and Bill McMartin. So you lucky three, I hope you're still Part of our audience. If you're not, you'll still receive the book. Um, not sure how. <laughs> I'm not going to be throwing it to you. So I assume what you should do is contact Ennis Blentic, our advancement officer at ennis.blentic at utoronto.ca, and he will ensure that you get that book. Um, so let me just say that this has been a wonderful event. Uh, I want to thank David Miller for an inspiring talk. Um, I especially appreciate climate talks that are not entirely doomsday scenarios. I mean, we all know well enough the bind we're in and that we have to act, but to be given concrete evidence of how one can act and how that can be rooted in municipal action, I think is something we can all take heart in. Um, I'll also recommend that those of you who did not have the chance to hear an environmentally themed talk we provided last year by Sapora Berman, you go on our YouTube channel, I don't usually plug our YouTube channel, but, and hear her talk. Uh, and it's a, it's a great compliment to David's. So thank you again, David. I'll just say that um, if there were the option of a write-in candidate in our next mayoral election, uh, I'd be, I know where I'd, whose name I'd be scribbling in. Um, so I remember the glory days of when you were mayor and I'm still shedding a few bitter tears about the fact that 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 those days are not with us at the moment, but maybe better days ahead. Um, I want to thank uh, Sita uh, and Jaron both for their roles on the Harold Ennis Foundation. Jaron for superb moderating, uh, as was the case the last time he moderated for us, a few Harold Ennis lectures back. Um, I want to thank Elder Wabagoon uh, for again her own inspiring words uh, and a reminder that we are merely, uh, you know, let's say the occupiers of this earth and we have to remember the bounty it gives us. And the thanks to the team at Ennis that uh, helps put these together. I hope I don't forget everyone, but um, Victoria watson Sebjack, Ned Seeger, Ian Logan, Shayla Anderson, and the aforementioned 
and it's blended. And what more can I say except to tell you that we have one more event coming up in a week's time, not a little more than a week. Uh, Jesse Wente, who was last year's Harold Innes uh, lecturer, is coming back to us again, this time to talk about his recent book, Reconciled. And that will be November 25th at 7 p.m. with the moderator, Phelan Johnson. And other than that, I have nothing more than to say thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, this has been another great Harold Innes lecture. And I uh, hope you'll join us for the Jesse Wente talk and the others that we have coming up in 2022. I think we'll be kicking off with the delayed uh, event, the book event. Um, oh dear, <laughs> Michelle Orange's book, Something Flame. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Anyway, just uh, you'll see it coming up. Uh, so that was a really adept way of ending this evening. So thank you all for coming. And oh yes, pure flame. <laughs> just got, got feel like I'm one of those clueless <laughs> news readers who just got prompted. Anyway, pure flame, and that will be in January. So thank you again uh, for coming. Thank you to David Miller for this talk, and see you next time. Good night, everyone.